Good morning. Good to be here together today. Um, I was talking to my brother earlier this week and he and his wife, they live in Alberta, Canada. And they went to church and he says they wouldn't let us sing. <laughs> and uh, I'll tell you, it's, not, it's hard not to sing in church. Now that song, I mean, I was ready to stand up and raise my hand and do the whole thing. I mean, it, that's the truth. I had I asked Thomas if he takes requests this morning and on the organ and I, I for some reason a mighty fortress is our our God was on my mind and there's a program I listen to that that's their their theme song so he played that for me and that's a great hymn uh, Martin Luther wrote that Father of the Reformation it reminds us that we're not we don't have to be afraid but we are many times aren't we we face things that are bigger than we are. And, that are dangerous, and uh, uh, as our brother said, uh, that the country right now is probably so messed up that it's hard to comprehend what. But don't forget, God's active when things seem the messiest, right? In our li- in our personal lives, in our family situation, and in our country, and the world. Um, I was thinking here a few weeks ago. It was 50, over 50 years ago, in 1968, during the Democratic Convention, that we had some of the worst riots in Chicago the country ever has see, had seen it up to that point. But there are other times in our history when uh, people marched on Washington and were not happy with what was going on. And so our history is full of those things. I, I, I believe God's trying to get our attention. I do believe that. And I think we have to be attentive to how to approach him. And that's what I want to talk about today. Um, the Bible admonishes us many, many, many times, many, many places, uh, through the example of uh, great heroes of the faith, uh, to actual uh, instruction on how to approach the Lord. One of my favorites is Psalm 24, where it says, "The Lord is the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it." For the founded, it is founded upon the seas, and he established it upon the waters. Then it asks a question. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Now, of course, they're referring to Mount Zion, the hill, the high, the high place in Jerusalem, where they built, eventually built the temple. It says, He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. He will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. And after he says that, how how do we approach him on this high place of godly power and authority and beauty? Then it tells us how to, how to respond to that great invitation to, re, to go. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, so the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. You can almost picture David coming into Jerusalem after ha- having slain his ten thousands, whereas Saul had only slain his thousands. Remember that? He w- Saul wasn't too happy about that. But you can see the, and of course the Roman uh, legions would come back after a great victory and they'd march the uh, slaves uh, of the country of the people they'd conquered and um, they'd uh, bring back artifacts and things and artwork and all kinds of things and they'd have a, a great parade down the street, main street of Rome and they'd celebrate the victory. And so that's the uh, idea they have here. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and lift them up, you ancient doors, the king of glory may come, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? And our response is the Lord Almighty. He is the king of glory. And there's another psalm that I've been meditating on a lot. I'm not, I'm not in the sermon yet, so don't count. it doesn't count, okay? Psalm 11. Um, there's a question in Psalm 11 that is asked. 
And uh, this, I've just been really thinking about this these past few m months with uh, COVID and with the uh, uh, protests and the uh, uh, fire, uh, the fires and the bombings and the looting and all, all the stuff that's been going on in the name of something terrible that has been hijacked by thieves, using it for the uh, detriment of the country and for the, uh, of the people. He says, "In the Lord I take refuge." How then can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bows, they set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? That's the question. What are we supposed to do about it? What's the next verse? You tell me. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes the sons of men. His eye examines them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked and those who love violence his soul hates. On the wicked he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching wind will be their lot. For the Lord is righteous, he loves justice. Upright men will see his face. In other words, when all this is happening, God doesn't change, right? He's still there. So remember that. And now this gets me to the, the real uh, point of the message I want to share today. Lord, as we come into your presence, we ask you to help us proclaim the word, the word of truth that will see us through these days of uh, illness, disease, brokenness, sadness, loss, uh, questions, uh, the political unrest we see in our country, uh, the, the desecration of sacred symbols, that means so much to us because blood has been shed to maintain uh, the, the, the joy of knowing freedom through our Declaration of Independence, through our, the Constitution of the United States, and through the flag, Lord, that has stood over the uh, fallen bodies of many men and women who have given their life's blood to proclaim uh, the freedom and, the, and the, the salvation that can be found in this great nation when we turn our eyes and our hearts to you under God, one nation under God. And help us remember, Lord, to be under God means to be submitted to God and not to gambling and not to drunkenness and not to drugs and not to overdoses and not to all the things that we have been seeing, Lord, in the past uh, generation. Deliver us from these things, Father, as we turn our hearts to you and as we look to see how we should make our approach as you call us to come before you. In Jesus' name, amen. One of my favorite passages uh, in the Old Testament is found in as Isaiah 55. I have it all marked up, this chapter. I want you to listen to these words. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you, will have, you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest fare. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the people. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations that do not know you will hasten to you. Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his ways, and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and make it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, 
So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty or void, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst forth into song before you, and the trees, all the trees of the field, will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the pine tree, instead of the briars the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign which will not be destroyed. And so we have to ask ourselves that question, why do we fret and stew and worry and labor for so many things that don't satisfy, right? And I can look back over my life and see many times when I spent uh, time and money and effort for things that really aren't too eternal. Uh, so so the, God is inviting us. Now, this, this passage in Isaiah 55 reminds me of the passage in Matthew chapter 11. 28 and 29 where Jesus says what come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am meek and lowly of heart and you will find rest for your souls that's a promise right so drawing near to God is something that's awesome and beyond our ability to fully comprehend, I believe, but it's something that's very necessary in our lives. Uh, over the past few months, we've seen uh, uh, things that, we've that we believe are very essential declared non-essential, which is, I would dispute that. I got a call from the hospital the other day, a friend of mine who's in the hospital up there. I have not been back to the hospital as chaplain since March, and uh, this person, is in need of spiritual care in the hospital. Well, you're not allowed to go. I can't go. It's not essential. Because we're made more than, than clay and flesh and bone. We're, we're, we're a living soul, the Bible says. And people in trouble need ministry to their soul. They need shepherding. They need pastoring and care. And care. All of us do. And so I find, so, so often I get so frustrated that when is this thing going to end so I can do what God's called me to do? Uh, it, it, you can't hardly uh, do on a screen or over the phone what you can do in person, right? There's a lot of churches that have, that have gone to virtual services. They've done the, we did here a little bit, the virtual where you come in and record it and people can get on. And it's wonderful to be able to use technology that way, but there's something missing. And that's something that's missing is the actual interaction between the people as we gather in a place like this, a beautiful place set aside, set apart, sanctified for the worship of a living God. And so uh, today I want to look at this passage from Hebrews. This is the sermon now. You can start counting your time here. <laughs> Chapter 10. I want to look at verses 19 through 24, 25, sorry. Hebrews 10, 19-25. Now chapter 10 of Hebrews precedes chapter 11. Brilliant, right? I did learn math. But chapter 11, if you remember, is called the faith chapter. And so after you read chapter 10, he, the writer leads you... Remember, the Bible wasn't divided originally into chapters and verses. So he would go right into this wonderful litany of wonderful holy people that we uh, think of from the Old Testament, uh, great men and women of faith, uh, people who uh, withstood uh, attack and won victories, uh, people that, uh, remember Samson, one man, was able to, to slay more Philistines in his death than he did his whole life. And of course the Philistines represent the enemy. Uh, we think of David and Goliath and several others. Abraham, who was called of God to leave his home and go to a place that God would show him. All the, chapter 11 is filled with uh, wonderful stories of faith. But in chapter 10 he says this, verse 19, and where, and where these have been for forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, now he's thinking of the holy of holies in the temple, 
Remember, they're Jewish. These are Jewish Christians. People who have come through Judaism as Jews and come to Christ as their Messiah. He's saying, so he's re referring, as you read the book of Hebrews, you see a lot of Old Testament illustrations. And he says here, Therefore, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, no one would enter the most holy place except the high priest once a year. And some people said that they'd tie a, a, a rope to his ankle in case he dropped dead and they had to pull him out in, in the presence of the living God. But he says, we're entering the most holy pl place, how? By the blood of Jesus, verse 20, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us, I call this the let us chapter. <laughs> let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up the meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as we see the day, referring to the day of judgment, the day of Christ appearing. So let's just take a look at this for a moment. Um, when we come, we recently uh, flew out to see my daughter and son-in-law and ch grandchildren out in Montana. And I don't know, we, we had, uh, it, was a, it wasn't a one-flight deal. It was, we had to get, uh, they take off and land three, four times, three, four, four airports anyway. I know it was four airports. So, so we left Pittsburgh, uh, flew to Georgia, Atlanta, left Atlanta, flew to Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, left Salt Lake City, Utah, flew to to uh, Great Falls and landed there. Every time an airplane takes off and lands, what do they do? What, what does the pilot have to do? He goes through a, a checklist. Well, now why would they do that? Because being very uh, understanding uh, about aerodynamics uh, like they do, pilots are very well taught and understand all that stuff. We're just riding in the plane and uh, we were distanced, you know, we had uh, a seat between us in the big plane and then they tried, we had to wear our masks and they gave us a little bag with some goodies in it when we got in and so on and so forth. But uh, when it comes to the airplane, I want the pilot to know more than I do. <laughs> I want him to know everything on that checklist is checked out and I want him to approach the runway and each time, of course, computers help with all that now in these, these big airliners. But nonetheless, when it comes right down to it, no, who's gonna, who can forget Sully on the Hudson River, right? The, a guy had to pull something out of his hat to get, to get that plane down safe. So here we are. We're coming in every time. I said, well, and I, we hit the ground. One time we hit so hard it bounced a couple times. That wasn't a real smooth landing. And there was a lot of, of disturbance. You know how that goes. But th there's a certain way to approach. And so here, how do you come before the living God? He tells us how, right? First of all, he says, with, we have Jesus. The, the Old Testament Jews didn't have Jesus yet. He was coming. He was the promise. But all they had was some men that were high priests and uh, that purify, had to purify themselves even before they'd pronounce the people pure or, or delivered from their sins. There were many annual feasts and a lot of uh, uh, detailed laws. I'm not talking about the, the Ten Commandments, which are, are very basic to any human decency. But I'm just talking about all the particular laws that the Jewish people had to practice in following their faith. And so here these Hebrew believe these Hebrew believers have left Judaism in the strictest form and come to Christ as their Messiah. That was anathema to the Jew. There are a lot of people 
who were upset about that, their families. Some people think that the Apostle Paul, when he turned to Christ, he, they don't know because he never said so, but these are some theories that are out there by uh, Bible students. He may have been married because it's hard, highly unlikely that a member of the, of the uh, Jewish uh, Pharisaical leadership would not be married. But upon receiving Christ, his wife may have left him. We don't know. That's just a thought. But Paul was, had a single mind to serve God. So uh, the, he's, he's the writer, he's, he's the writer, say some people, the writer of Hebrew, Hebrews. Others people think it's Luke or somebody else. But in this portion of scripture, very clearly we're being instructed how to come to God through Christ as a new and living way that's been opened for us into the Holy of Holies. We don't need a priest anymore. That's what I tell my, my brothers and sisters that are Catholics. I say, I, I mean, I'm thankful that there are people serving that position, but you don't need a priest anymore. If you're a believer, you are a priest, according to Scripture. You've been washed in the blood. You've been saved and baptized, born again. You know, you're a living servant of God. And God said he will make the people of God through Christ a nation of priests right did you ever think of yourself as a priest <laughs> because you come to God on behalf of other people don't you when you pray right you come to God when you're uh, anxious about something or someone else you love is anxious you come in faith before God as a, and you, you represent them before him at the throne of grace so he says, this new and living way has been opened for us through the curtain. Okay, the curtain was the place that demarked the holy place from the holy of holies. Remember that curtain that when Jesus was crucified, what happened? It tore from the top to the bottom. We, we have access now. And since we have a great, great high priest over the house of God, here's the admonition. Approach him... Draw near to him, first of all, with a sincere heart. What did Jesus tell the woman at the well? Remember, she said, well, when the Messiah comes, he'll tell us what's right and wrong, what, whether we should worship here or whether we should worship in Jerusalem. And, and what did Jesus tell her? I am he. And I'm telling you, God's looking for people to worship him. How? In spirit and in truth. That's how we worship. God doesn't want liars coming before him pretending and hypo hypocrites. God hates hypocrisy. He hates pride. You can't, be, you can't be a proud person in yourself and think that you deserve uh, all the accolades and all the promotion and all the uh, recognition. And, and it just doesn't work. When it comes to God, he only understands those that submit. He is the high ruler of the universe after all. Jesus is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, isn't he? We, we proclaim that. So where is the room for pride in that? Now it doesn't mean you become so uh, sloppy about yourself. That, that I'm not talking about that. I'm, we approach him with a sense of awe that I want to be at my best. More than any boss you ever had who may have called you in for an interview after something bad happened at work. More, more than any principal that ever said, come to the office, I want to talk to you, as he held the paddle out. <laughs> we knew what kind of a conversation that would, was, right? One time all the boys got paddled uh, in, my, in my elementary school because we threw snowballs at Dale Souter. And we threw those snowballs at him because his ears were bigger than everybody else's. <laughs> So I think we deserved three whacks, don't you? And all the principal said was, bend over and touch your ankles, grab your ankles. And we got three. And it didn't destroy my, my humanity. It didn't make me into a vegetable. It, it made me realize that some things are wrong to do and some things are right. If that was the case, you wouldn't see maybe a, a federal buildings being burned and destroyed and looting and rioting and all that stuff. So he says, Draw near with a sincere heart, no hypocrisy, in full assurance. The second thing is in full assurance of faith. We are people who have placed our faith in a living Savior. So even though it's, there are hard times, 
And there, like, like that says there, faith that does not make things easy, it makes them what? Possible. It doesn't say it's everything's always easy. People that live by faith don't go around saying, oh, it's, it's simple. It's, it, sometimes it's not to hold on to your faith through the trials and the troubles and the heartaches and the misery and the sorrows and the illnesses. I'm telling you, the older you get, the more you have to complain about if someone will listen. <laughs> but don't get, me, don't get me in a circle of people talking about their aches and pains and all that stuff. I got more to do with my life than sit around and hurt and tell people how I hurt and want sympathy. There's a book I've been reading about, uh, it's, it's about a, a senior citizen home where this man has written a secret diary and it's been printed in 35 languages. And all it is is a diary entry every day. But one of the things they did there, a group of them formed something called the Old But Not Dead Yet Club. And they, they get together and they do things, uh, little things they can do. It's, they're able to leave on uh, vans and buses and travel. And, and th this group of people decided they weren't going to just sit around a table and complain about everything and be miserable and cynical and mean. And it's, it's, it's been, I've been enjoying it. And there's a second one he's written. I'm reading that one now. That's not what God calls us to. We're to be people full of assurance and faith. Assurance in who? Who, who is our assurance in? Who, what's his name? You know his name? Jesus. <laughs> he has accomplished. He says, in the world you'll have what? Trouble. But be of good courage, for I have overcome the world. Where is the overcoming power? It's not in us, it's in him. But because he's in us, it's in us too. We just have to tap the reserve. If you have a bank account and a checkbook or a debit card, I don't like debit cards. I still use checks and write them out. I'm one of those old timers. But anyway, now you can just give it to the store and they'll just put it through. You don't even have to write on it anymore. But anyway, if you have an account, you know when you put, if you keep track of that account and you're faithful to put money in it, you know you can take money out of it. As long as it's not more than that's in it, right? Okay, what do you have in your account in heaven right now? What do you have in your account in heaven? Is it full? It's over full. It's full of the grace of God through Jesus Christ. How much grace do we need to live? A lot, <laughs> right? Uh, we need more than the, uh, Jeff Bezos has money. We need more grace than Jeff Bezos has money. That's a lot. He's a billionaire, right? How many times? One or two? I don't know. Or Bill Gates or whoever your uh, top billionaire is. We need grace. So he's given us, he said, through Christ we've received grace. And what is that grace for? To receive help in our time of need. In our time of need, we have grace. So he says, we approach him with a sincere heart through the Holy of Holies right into the throne in full assurance of faith. And here's the third thing, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. You know what, you know what keeps us away from God a lot of times? At least me, a guilty conscience. I don't go to God about things because I, I feel uh, I haven't been all, the, all that I should be. I, I know I should have been better about this. I shouldn't have said that to that person. I shouldn't have tromped on the gas to get around that guy that was going pokey slow. I shouldn't have... Uh, you, you know how we are. But the Bible doesn't say that we're perfect. Just that our conscience, we can let the word of God... How does God cleanse the conscience? Through the word. Someone said prayer is us talking to God and the Bible is God talking to us. So if we pray and we stay in the word, there's a relationship there through the Holy Spirit, right? It's done through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And he's going to send a helper to comfort us. To walk with, through life with us, the paraclete. 
the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit takes our prayers that sometimes are childlike. You ever have a little kid come up to you and say, Grandpa, uh, give, me, give me a dime. What do you want that for? I want to go buy the biggest candy bar I can find. Well, a dime doesn't buy a candy bar anymore. Right? It may have one time. Uh, or your, your, your child will come up to you and say something. They want something. And it's not time yet. You know, they, they don't come up and say, Dad, three years old, give me the car keys. I want to go downtown and meet some friends. Well, you will someday, but not now. Right? There's a time and a place for everything. So, I don't know how to pray as I should often. Do you? Sometimes I don't, I don't know how to put words around what I'm saying. Well, Paul in Romans 8 says what? Sometimes we don't know how to pray as we should, but we have an advocate in heaven who intercedes for us and the Spirit himself helps us in our prayers even if we don't say it all just right and perfect. So sometimes I'd rather blurt out a prayer or a praise that may not be perfect than to sit there and just say nothing. God wants a relationship with us. He wants a two-way conversation. He wants us to hear him in his word and through his word and spirit. He wants to hear from us. And that's the relationship we have. So that's what cleans our conscience and keeps, it, keeps us up to date. Every once in a while you have to do a little house cleaning, right? And this house needs that cleaning too. And so we do spiritual house cleaning. Lord, Holy Spirit, come in. Show me. I'm starting a new week. Some things last week weren't, didn't seem right. I've been upset about all this stuff going on in the news. I've been watching too much news and not reading enough Bible, right? I've been listening to too many men and not enough to the Spirit. Sometimes we need silence. Sometimes we need solitude. Sometimes we need simplicity. Uh, Paul admonished the Corinthians, don't let anyone steal the simplicity of Christ from your faith. It's so easy for us to get so wrapped up in junk and all tangled up. My dad, I, I, when I was a kid learning to tie my shoes, I'd always end up with knots. And I would make those knots so tight, I couldn't do anything about it. So I'd go to my father. My dad could get any knot out of any tie, tie, bad tie I had. And he'd, he'd, he'd get his fingers down there. I don't know how he did it. He didn't have any fingernails. I don't know how he did it. He, pull, he would get that knot out, and then he'd tie my shoe for me. Our Father in Heaven knows what we need. And we have access to it by grace through faith. Right? So let's not be shy about going to him. So the clean conscience now. And then he says, number four, having our bodies washed with pure water. Well, that's a picture of the, the priest of God in the temple would always have to be cleaning things. They'd be washing vessels. They'd be washing themselves. Well, guess what? By, Paul said in Ephesians, there's how many baptisms? One baptism. Woo! That's the pure water. So, by the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we're cleansed, prepared, we're initiated into our call as uh, the uh, priest of the Lord God Almighty under the great high priest, Jesus Christ. And that's how we serve him in the world. And that's how we approach him. And then he goes on with a couple other uh, reminders here in the last few couple verses there. So he says... If, that's, if this is the case, if this is the way, this is the relationship we have with God through Christ. This open relationship, open to the very throne room of heaven, the Holy of Holies. If this is the relationship, then let's do some things. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we have, or we profess, for he who promised is what? Faithful. This means we review the promises of God often. Find places in your Bible where you have underlined promises or where you've written in your journal or whatever you do in your devotional walk. Write these things down. Lord, you said in your word, you promised this. I'm calling on you. I'm claiming that promise in the power of the Lord Jesus and the blessing of the Holy Spirit. Lord, hear my prayer. It may not be anything sure you may not even be sure what to pray about in that situation but he knows what you need and he'll see to it then he goes on and said uh, 
And let us consider how we may encourage one another. Uh, the new NIV says spur one another on. Uh, the King James, I think, says provoke one another. <laughs> you want to provoke somebody, remind them how to be faithful. <laughs> right? Especially a brother and sister or a husband or wife. Now be careful, guys. <laughs> Just a warning. <laughs> let us uh, consider how to give one another to spur one another on toward love and good deeds. When are the love and good deeds supposed to stop in the church? Never. Only when Christ comes back. And then it's going to be heaven. So the only one, if, if Christians are the only ones to bring a little heaven to earth, when is our job done? Never. Not as long as we have a breath. So we stand in faith, reminding each other, provoking one another toward more love and good deeds even to those who are enemies by the way and I, I I've got some I've got some solutions for all my enemies but that may not be God's solution remember when the Jesus and the disciples were walking toward Jerusalem and they came into Samaria and he wanted to go to a village in Samaria and they what said no they wouldn't let him come and the disciples said do you want us to call fire down Jesus and what did he say to him? You don't know what spirit you're of. I didn't come to do that. He came to die on the cross. And that's what he was going to do. But all they understood was they were they'd been slighted. People didn't want my love and good work. Well, then we'll just call fire down on them. Isn't that the way we are? That's our nature. We have to overcome that nature. Then he goes on to say, uh, let us not, here it is, this, I want to come to this, let us not give up what? Meeting together. Seems like a lot of people have given up meeting together. What's the, uh, uh, can we meet together when there's COVID? Can we meet together when there's all these troubles and tr can we meet? Yeah, we can meet. We can meet together. The Bible never says stop meeting together. You know that? We are to meet together not as some have the habit of doing, not meeting together, but let us encourage one another all the more. That's what meeting together does. It says, are you, are you in the word? Is the word in you? How's your prayer life? How's your spiritual walk? Where does your soul need comforting? Christians should be the most honest people with one another in the world. The most true. There's there, nothing, nothing that's happened in my life I should be afraid to share with you. I may not want to go into all the raunchy details, but I can say, you're my brother, you're my sister. And the devil's been really bothering me about that. You know, the devil likes to take old history and then whack us over the head with it. Remember that? Remember this? Remember, remember what you said? Remember what you did? Blah, blah, blah. You know? And then we say, whoa, 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 whoa. There's the cross. That's where that was taken care of, devil. Get behind me. I've got better things to do than listen to your lies. Right? So that's what we do for each other when we gather together and worship and sing and pray. And, and uh, even if we can't shake hands <laughs> or hug one another. So... And all the more, says we should be meeting all the more as you see the day of the Lord approaching. Right? He's coming. He's coming as sure as this word promises. He's coming. And when he comes, I want to be found ready. Right? I want to be found doing what his will is. I want to be found thinking about the good things about him. And about his life and about the, the eternal life he's promised. I don't want to be thinking about the next car I'll drive or the next boat. I, 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 that's okay, I suppose. I'll, I saw a little guy driving up the hill today on the way down with a little tiny boat. And I said, there's my man. A little tiny boat, just enough to get out in the water where the fish really are. But maybe he should have been in church. I don't know. <laughs> but don't, don't stop meeting together. Don't stop encouraging one another. Don't, don't give up your hope. Persevere. And that's what he was saying. 
to these Jewish Christians, don't give up because they were tempted to give up. And in these times of doubt and fear and uncertainty and sadness and brokenness and wondering what's happening to the country and well, I still believe in the God of heaven and as our brother said this morning, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and pray and turn, to turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. As far as I know, that's still in the Bible. Of course, he was talking to the Jews at that point. But to me, that's a promise you can carry forward into all time for all of God's people. So he's not done yet. Don't count him out. Live by faith. Don't give up. Lord, we thank you for your blessing today of presence in your word. And we just pray, Lord, it will go forth to accomplish its purpose and not return void. In the name of our Lord Jesus, amen. Turn to number 40. I think we're going to sing a song, right? And please stand. Stand.